like ACNP and SOBP presentations that I got to be um, even um, you know more familiar and kind of really kind of recognized um, everything that she's done. So um, just to reiterate that I think you know having chances for that networking is really important. Um, so a little bit about so I did do some hunting to, to try to figure out your trajectory, your career trajectory. Yeah. So. Yeah. Um, from, um, so it, it looks like, so Dr. Brackford did her undergraduate education at Florida State, but I think since then has been at Vanderbilt. So for graduate education and then all the way up to now a full professor, which is awesome. Um, her doctorate was in developmental psychology um, with minors in quantitative psychology and developmental disabilities. Um, she's currently full professor and director of the division of psychology in the department of psychiatry and behavioral sciences at Vanderbilt. Um, and like I said, she's been actively involved in multiple organizations, ACNP, SOBP, ADAA are the ones that kind of I'm most familiar with. I'm sure there's probably others. Um, currently managing editor of JAMA Psychiatry, I believe. No, not anymore. Just a few years. Oh, OK. Yeah. <laughs> um, used to be. Um, used to be. Yeah. yeah. Funded by numerous grants um, in, from NIMH, NIAAA, I think NICHD, Veterans Health Administration, just so multiple um, kind of funding agencies that um, really reflects, I think, the transdiagnostic nature of, of her work. So um, I think, you know, incredibly close to kind of our perspective on things. Um, um, her work is, you know, really translational, very transdiagnostic, um, trying to understand the neuroscience of anxiety, but the how that relates to not only anxiety disorders, but, you know, and PTSD, but also schizophrenia um, and alcohol use disorder and kind of across the board um, and using multiple levels of analysis, similar to what we're used to doing here, trying to um, Put everything together and you know was one big puzzle so from genetics to neuroimaging to behavior to physiology um, and i would say you know her work has been particularly important for um for uh kind of putting forward the importance of behavioral inhibition and as well as bnst neural circuitry um so and, and i should say despite all the successes that you've had it's really hard to find a very good biography of you <laughs> online we need to start like a wikipedia page or something where all the stuff is in one place so um but so i i apologize if i'm missing important accolades that uh, that i wasn't um able to hunt down but um hopefully you can correct any misstatements or anything that i did make um so i'm really looking forward to hearing your talk and i'll pass it over to you Awesome, thank you. Um, thank you for that introduction. Um, so I'll note for the postdocs, um, Robin can't find anything because I'm not good at self-promotion. <laughs> um, and that's just my, that's my own temperament. So I will work on that, um, but you did a wonderful job. Um, and my other note for postdocs is I met Martin um, because I completely uncomfortable to me very many years ago, actually reached out to his close research um, colleague at the time, Murray Steen, and said, oh, I love your work. Like, can we have coffee at SOBP? Um, and Murray brought along Martin, who actually I probably had the closer research alignment with, but just didn't realize how the world worked. And, and they graciously sat and talked to me for a little bit. And so I followed his work for a long time and then had the opportunity to work with him at JAMA Psychiatry, and which was great. And so I've watched um, Liber and, and Robin's work and your trajectory um, from postdoc into faculty. And so it's been um, really an honor to be invited to speak. And I've loved getting to talk to people today. And it is, it's nice to have um, connections with people doing similar work and from different perspectives. Um, there's a lot I could talk about. Um, I have chosen for today to give you some kind of new ideas. So some of it will be this history of how I came about to study the BNST, but also sharing some ideas that I'd love to get feedback on. So it'll be um, some old data, but a lot of new data um, that we are in the process of, of writing up. And I will go ahead and share my screen. I could probably come give a whole other talk on inhibited temperament and child anxiety and behavioral inhibition, um, which I would love to do that maybe in person um, once we're back to, to being live. So um, these are ideas. And, and again, for the postdocs and trainees, this these ideas were forced because I had to find a way to stay viable in science and I had colleagues really pushing me and I needed to um, really find a novel direction. And so that led to what has 
become just incredibly gratifying and satisfying work that's led me in directions outside of my comfort zone. And so I'm gonna tell you a bit about these ideas today and I'm titling this, What Causes Anxiety? That's the core of my interest is anxiety um, and how now to build this reversal, reverse translational model. And so I'll, I'll tell you what these ideas are about. Um, I will leave the chat room open. And so if people have questions, feel free to use that. That's probably easier than um, trying to get my attention, but feel free to also just speak up. So this idea of this reverse translational model is that we started with this clinical disorder that people were interested in building animal models about. So we had anxiety and there were animal models um, built around fear. So I'm calling that translation, um, but you may call it something else. And then I'm calling reverse translation, taking those models um, from animal models back into humans. And the goal is then to take these human findings based on rodent findings back into humans. And so I'll tell you about a partnership I've developed and I'm calling that the final frontier. And the goal is that we could actually find a way to work across um, bench to bedside and, and clinical translational research in the middle to actually move science forward in a novel way. But this is gonna take training people who can speak both languages. Um, and I'll tell you, I'll give you an example of that at the end. Okay, so you all know, but I'll just highlight, um, one in three people will have an anxiety disorder. Um, while they are largely ignored, I think by NIMH and many funding agencies, um, and my theory is that many scientists are anxious themselves, and so they think this is completely normative, but in fact, um, it's quite significantly impairing and distressing. And for me, being a developmental psychologist, I'm really um, aware of and interested in this fact that it's got an early onset and has a chronic course, especially for social anxiety disorders, not very responsive to treatment. And so over the course of a lifetime, you have very significant disability where children's developmental trajectories are very tightly shaped by their anxiety. And so they do not end up with really the potential that they could have had. And if you don't care at all about anxiety, maybe you care about the fact that early anxiety leads to later risk for depression, substance use disorder, and independent of depression, heightened risk for suicide. And so for me, this is a really tractable public health problem that if we could identify and intervene with kids early, we could prevent all of these other things. Um, that work, at least in my hands, has not been highly fundable. So while it informs what I do, um, you'll see that I've taken some other avenues to, to still help inform this neuroscience and hopefully eventually to be implemented um, with kids. So I'm gonna just start you with, off with this basic um, background in animal literature of these early animal models. Um, so one of the earliest ideas of how to look at anxiety in rodents was to look at fear and built on Pavlov's classical conditioning, people developed a conditioned fear paradigm. And so I'll review um, very briefly, but you can take something like an unconditioned stimulus, which is a foot shock, you can pair it with a tone um, so that now every time you hear the tone, you will start to associate that with a shock. And then later we can study just the condition response. So we can look at fear response to a tone. And decades of really elegant um, systematic work identified the neural circuitry involved in at least auditory fear conditioning, which at the hub was the amygdala um, and different parts of the amygdala. And so you can see it's, it's linked to auditory cortex and somatosensory cortex and has these readouts that are really potentially translational targets where we can look at things like freezing blood pressure and hormones. Um, Mike Davis and then many others translated some of that into something that's a naturally occurring um, response called a startle. And so humans also have startle. So anybody who, if somebody comes up behind you unexpectedly, if you kind of jump or startle, that's startle in humans. And what um, Mike Davis's group looked at was well, we can startle a rodent and their behavioral response is jumping. And for humans, we can also jump out of our seats if it's strong enough. Imagine being at a horror movie and that person jumps out and you startle. And they pair that with the classical fear conditioning. So this shock and tone. And then they could take the environment where you hear the tone and think you're gonna get shocked and they could add startle and look at what they then called fear potentiated startle. And here's what that looks like. So this is startle amplitude on the Y axis. So here's just the startle no noise. This is the amount of jumping. And if we add that fear cue environment, we can potentiate the startle with fear. And one of the core findings was that if we lesion the amygdala, we could abolish 
fear potentiated startle. And so that led to the idea that, oh, the amygdala is critical for this mechanism related to fear. And so that was called fear potentiated startle. Their group also then started to look at, well, what if we take things that are kind of anxiogenic in the environment that aren't classical conditioning, aren't conditioned fear, and so they looked at for rodents light. So rodents do not like to be in the light because it's a predator risk for humans. This would be analogous to being in the dark. And so they could take the original look at startle and now just do it in a brightly lit environment. And they found that that also would potentiate startle, but in a really different way. Um, and so they started off first thinking, well, let's also lesion the amygdala and see what happens. Um, so this was just what I showed you before. But also they wanted to look at another brain region called the BNST or the bed nucleus of the stria terminalis. And when they did that with the original fear potentiated startle, they found that BNST lesions did not reduce fear potentiated startle at all. Here's light potentiated startle, so dark, and you can see light potentiates or increases startle. Amygdala lesions did not change light potentiated startle, but BNST lesions did. And so this led to this early idea um, in rodents that the amygdala is involved in fear potentiated startle or fear, and the BNST is involved in light potentiated startle, which they um, called anxiety, or because it's rodents, anxiety-like behaviors. And so the idea that they put forth was that while fear and anxiety have the same anatomical targets, so just this whole list of targets in the middle, all of these govern what feels like fear or anxiety to us, um, that they may actually have distinct mediators so that the amygdala is really related to fear. So you have a predictable threat, you have a fear response, but then you should immediately recover. That's the evolutionary adaptive fear. But that the BNST governs anxiety, which might look like this, an unpredictable threat, and then you just sustain kind of hypervigilance and hyperarousal over time. But they feel the same because the, anat the anatomical targets are the same. And so this is probably 20 years of research across multiple labs that led to these ideas. Um, I've cited some of the other just key labs below. So this was a really intriguing idea. I had been studying the amygdala um, and actually hadn't thought about this potential difference in anxiety. I just thought amygdala was related to anxiety. And so these ideas were really intriguing to me that perhaps the amygdala is involved in these very short-lived responses that again are evolutionarily adaptive that lead to fight or flight, and then might be specific to phobic stimuli. So you might imagine if you have a spider phobia, that would evoke this response, and also to predictable threats. But that there might be this other type of process that's more akin to pathological anxiety in humans, where the responses are sustained, where you have hypervigilance and avoidance. And the stimuli are not just a specific phobic stimuli, but are really the context, like a bad thing happened to me in this place, or I have to you have social anxiety, I need to order at a restaurant, or threats that are unpredictable, where you really need to maintain hypervigilance over time or this preparedness. Um, so we had these, what was pretty compelling evidence from rodents that there might be separable processes. And I became very interested in thinking about, well, how could we study that in humans? So I'll call this reverse translation. How would we, how would we test this in humans? So it's great if they're finding it in rodent models, but if we're not actually applying it to humans, I think we're really missing out on that opportunity. And so I thought that there were these um, two potential ways to do this. Um, and this was probably back in, just to give you context, like 2013, 2014, I started thinking about this. Um, and I thought, well, first we need to actually be able to measure BNST function in humans. Um, and then we need a task that can elicit these two distinct processes, fear and anxiety. Um, the first had not been done yet, although people were publishing imaging studies where they said this might be this BNST area. Um, the second actually was being done by a group at NIMH um, led by Christian Grion, and I'll tell you about that in a minute. So the first thing was that the BNST was gonna be pretty hard to image. So here's a, a clear brain. The red is the amygdala, the blue is the BNST. When I had started um, studying the amygdala using imaging methods in like 2008 or 2009, some people thought you actually couldn't do it. It was too small to image. Um, and the amygdala is about the size of an almond and we can 
pretty easily these days measure it with um, three millimeter resolution. Here's the BNST in contrast. It's the size of a sunflower seed. Um, I'll credit my previous student, Suzanne Avery, who really, really was intent on finding what the analogous seed or object would be um, to put it in a paper. And so now people readily talk about the BNST is the size of a sunflower seed. So she figured that out. It's also kind of the shape of a sunflower seed. And you really need one millimeter resolution um, to see this structurally. And so um, we were fortunate to be at Vanderbilt where we had a seven Tesla scanner. So the first thing we did, we actually tried to see, could we get it, look at it at 3T? And so this is an example of a structural image at 3T. We had this 7T scanner. Um, if you look kind of at the cortical folding and gyration, you should be able to see some greater clarity. Um, and here within the hippocampus, you can actually see um, the folding and white matter within the hippocampus. So there is greater resolution um, with the 7T. But you actually, like you could see where the BNST was, but you couldn't really clearly segment the boundaries. And that was my goal was to be able to get a scan where we could segment the boundaries. Um, on this image, the BNST is kind of here and there's a couple complications. You have the lateral ventricles, those are a decent boundary, but this is the fornix. Um, and so there's white matter, there's gray matter, there's anterior commissure, and there's just this weird gray blob. It's tiny and the boundaries are there, but really hard to visualize at the small size. So um, I started off by just asking for graduate student volunteers to go into the scanner um, and one of them couldn't tolerate, just she doesn't like being in the scanner. So she came out. The other one turned out to have this like iron deposit artifact in her brain that blew out the signal in the BNST. Um, so I then went to my family, which at the time I think was allowed. I don't know if it's allowed anymore, but we put my husband in the 7T scanner and I had a technologist who was really intrigued and came in on the weekend and we scanned for free. The 7T at the time was free. And he pulled up every single sequence that they had developed for 7T. And I just kept looking at it. I was like, nope, can't see it, can't see it, can't see it. Um, until we got to this, which is um, called a grace sequence. And I was like, stop, I think I can see it. And so you get this very clear separation of CSF, gray matter and white matter with this scan. And so I said, I think that's it. So we scanned my husband and this is his claim to fame that the original publication had his brain in it. Um, and I took it back and luckily I already knew how to manually segment the amygdala. And so I was really good at that detail oriented work. And so I started working on the BNST and I, so I traced the BNST using um, uh, an atlas that had really great guidelines. And so here's what that looked like. It's a little embarrassing to go back and look at it now, like, oh, I would have done such a better job now. Um, but here's where the BNST is in an illustration. Here's where it is in fixed tissue. And then here was that original drawing. It's kind of boxy because these are voxels, they're square. And so you can't always get a really beautiful image, but we were able to identify this um, on a brain. Okay, well, so what? And who knows if this is even right? Um, so we've continued to modify our techniques um, and I'll show you in a minute the evidence of why we think this is right. Um, we also realized that we were interested in studying patients. And so it's great to have it at 7T and structural, but I can't do functional imaging very well at 7T. And I was studying combat veterans who often had shrapnel that had been removed and, and they could not go on the 7T. So we also worked on methods to translate that into 3T. Um, the grace image does, uh, the grace sequence doesn't work well in 3T, but a group who's doing hippocampal segmentation had published a T2 weighted sequence that does work well at 3T. And so we could also segment it at 3T. Um, this is work that was done by a RA at the time, who's now in grad school, Justin Tice. And what I'm showing here is our probabilistic 3T mask, which is published on Neurosynth. And here's how it overlaps with my original 7T mask. And so this is now being um, widely used and is available. Okay, so how do we validate the BNST mask? Well, the first thing is we knew from again from rodents, but also non-human primates, um, here reviewed by my colleague, Drew Fox. This is the human BNST here in red and blue. Um, here you can see how it links to the central nucleus of the amygdala by this white matter tract, which is called the stria terminalis, which is how it gets its name, bed nucleus of the stria terminalis. Um, and 
here's that central and medial BNST. And so we thought the first proof of concept was that the BNST should have greater connectivity with the central medial amygdala nucleus than with other nuclei. And so we used a published probabilistic atlas, which is here in blue, yellow, and green. We did structural connectivity with DTI, and here's the structural value. So we found much greater structural connectivity with the centromedial amygdala than with the basal lateral or superficial. Um, this was the resting state, the functional connectivity. It was equivalent across, and that's because it's not constrained by the white matter tracks. Um, so this is just kind of a point of reference, but we did find this validation in the connection with the centromedial nucleus. The other thing we wanted to do was just map how was the BNST connected across the whole brain and did we have evidence that that was similar to what we saw in non-human primates and rodents. And so not that every brain region or circuit should have um, homologous connections, but we thought if it did, that would be good evidence. And so this was work done by um, two students at the time. So um, much like you guys have, we, we had a, a nice repository of data of healthy subjects that had been collected, not nearly as large as yours, but we had data from my lab and then data from my collaborator, Stefan Hecker's lab, and we put um, that together and this gave us what back then felt really big, sample size of 100, um, which these days is not that large. But Suzanne did DTI, um, here's Suzanne Avery, she's now junior faculty at Vanderbilt, and Jackie Klaus did the resting state fMRI. Um, she's in her final year of child um, psychiatry fellowship at McLean. And we segmented the brain into um, 50 standard regions on each side and just look for connectivity. And so the regions that you see any color in are the regions that showed connectivity. And then the color maps within are just a heat map within that region to show you the variation. And so um, the take home message is all of the brain regions that we expected based on rodent and non-human primate work were found in humans for both structural um, connectivity and also functional. And some regions like the prefrontal cortex were not found for structural, but are found for functional connectivity. There was this interesting little region in the temporal pole right here that showed up for structural connectivity um, that is not found in non-human primates or rodents. But it turns out that the cytoarchitecture of this region is homologous to the anterior insula, which is found in rodents, and which I'll talk about a little bit later. Um, so we were really excited um, that paper was actually a little challenging to get published because um, many people thought you just could not image the BNST and that it was a lie. Um, but we finally got it published and to our delight later that year already had a replication. Um, so this was a figure from a paper where they actually put in the functional connectivity findings and showed theirs right next to it and showed a beautiful replication. Um, and then our colleagues at NIMH, um, Christian Grion and Monique Ernst, their postdoc at the time, Sam Teresi, also replicated this at 7T, um, where he was doing resting state connectivity. Um, since then, our colleagues, um, this is out of Alex Shackman's lab, and this is Christine Larson's lab, have been really interested in that dissociation I told you about BNST versus amygdala. That was not our original interest. Um, but there's been resting state connectivity papers. So here just saying, well, here's the BNST, here's the central nucleus of the amygdala. There are connections that are shared and there are also connections that are distinct. Um, Christine Larson's also done this with the basal lateral amygdala. And so that field is moving forward um, much more in the resting state world, much less in the DTI world. There's been um, one other paper but I'm a psychologist. I love psychological processes and mechanisms. So for me, the task is king. And I, I really wanted to have a task to be able to look at what's happening um, in the brain. Um, resting state has many advantages, but for me, doesn't answer the questions I'm really most interested in. What are we doing when we're anxious? What is the brain doing? And so there's this question, well, we have two different words, fear and anxiety, and in rodents, they may have different links, um, but, what do we see in humans? And Robin, excellent question. I, um, Robin asked, was there any connectivity to the insulin in that analysis? Not really, but I'm gonna come back to that. Um, and so just to refresh, we have this idea that fear is fear potentiated startle. It should be short-lived, um, evokes this fight or flight response and should be key for predictable threat. And then anxiety is really sustained and potentially to unpredictable threat. And so 
Um, shortly after we published that paper, I published a review looking at what we knew about the human BNST and proposed that it should be involved in both anxiety and addiction. So it turns out there's a huge literature of the BNST's role um, in rodent research and models in addiction. Um, Li Baun Chen, um, at the end of that year, published also a paper looking at this, uh, the BNST and amygdala. And then again, um, the close colleague, Ned Kalin and his student at the time, Drew Fox also published this. So this is just like, these were not my own ideas. The field had moved to a place where they were ready for this explosion of this idea of this other brain region. Um, and this is one of the benefits of going to conferences like Robin mentioned, like you're talking to other colleagues. Ned Kalin's group had been studying the BNST in, in non-human primates. And so they were really poised to start talking about this. The Li Bao and Chen comes much more from a rodent perspective. And so you have kind of this confluence of ideas, um, which has really helped this field um, get solidified and have people be interested in it is that we have colleagues doing that other work. And so in that review paper, um, which my two students were on, we really analyzed the literature across the two different domains, rodents and humans, and thought that this idea of distance of threat was really intriguing to us. And so in rodents, you could look at proximal versus distal or distant threat. And we thought that that mapped on nicely to predictable and unpredictable threat. Um, other groups were looking at the phasic versus sustained aspects. Um, but for us, because of the psychological interest, we really like this idea of these two different kinds of threats. And so we proposed that in humans, predictable threat would be amygdala and unpredictable threat would be the BNST. And that also mapped onto a really nice um, review paper that had been published looking at the role of uncertainty and anticipation and anxiety. And so it's hard to see, but down here they had proposed also that the BNST should be specifically involved in heightened reactivity to threat uncertainty versus all of these other aspects of uncertainty. So I'd mentioned that Christian Grion at NIMH had been working on a translational task. This was the most direct translation. Um, he did a beautiful job. He had contexts, which were similar to the rodent work. He had three kinds of cues, a no shock, shock only during the red square, which would be predictable, and shock at any time, which would be unpredictable. And these little symbols below show you that he's got tones um, and also shocks. And so he's measuring startle with these um, startle bursts. And so startle was a direct analogy to the rodent work. You can measure eye blink startle with humans. So it's actually really easy um, to do. And he really started testing this. And you can see he also picked the unpredictable versus predictable as the part that he wanted to translate versus the phasic or sustained. And so his, his initial work was really influential in my thinking. Um, and he was able to validate this task in patients, which I thought was really helpful. So this on the left is about panic disorder. So here's the patients where they showed greater startle magnitude to unpredictable relative to predictable shock. And you can see in comparison or healthy subjects, really not much difference. And if anything, maybe a little bit less in the two threat conditions. Um, and then Stephanie Gorka, who I think this was when she was a postdoc, um, has been studying uh, different anxiety disorders and is now doing alcohol work. And so this was here, the healthy control. So this is greater startled unpredictable relative to no shock. Here's generalized anxiety disorder, depression, um, delightful for me because I was really interested in social anxiety. Here's social anxiety disorder and then specific phobia. And so there was this evidence that something about unpredictability may map onto a range of anxiety disorders, um, more for things like social anxiety disorder, a little bit less for um, major depression and generalized anxiety disorder, but still a signal there. And those were all startled, which was great, but I was really intrigued by the brain um, and being able to look specifically at the BNST. And so I looked at what people had been doing to look at threat anticipation. And so there's many different paradigms. These are just some different examples. Um, I can't even remember why I picked what I picked. I think the design that I have is, is very analogous to this one where there's a queue, there's a waiting period, and then you have an image and another waiting period. Um, some groups, this is um, Floris Klumpers, who's out of the Netherlands, um, and he had published this nice paper showing 
that, yeah, there is this anticipation to threat of shock. And I'll show you right here's the BNST. And he saw it in um, two different independent experiments. Um, also, just take note of this pattern, which I'm going to come back to this pattern of responses. So in our review paper, we looked at all of the threat anticipation studies. At the time, there were 11. There were nine that we could do a meta-analysis of. And we just did a ginger ale a meta-analysis looking at the brain regions that showed increased activation to threat anticipation. This is in um, healthy individuals. Down below the area that's hand-drawn, that's the BNST. And so we did find evidence of increased activation in the BNST using our mask in these threat anticipation studies. Um, the left did not reach threshold, but if you just extracted signal and compared the right and the left, they were not significantly different. So I would not say that this is evidence of laterality, although it, it visually looks like it could be. Um, that question remains open. Um, at the same time, um, my good colleagues, um, Drew Fox and Alex Shackman, actually were interested in a different perspective. Instead of looking at how the BNST and amygdala might differ, they were proposing that they probably did the same thing. And so this was their review, and they looked at different meta-analyses using um, Neurosynth, and this was a, from a, two published papers. And you can see in the red boxes, there's like a voxel here in blue, and in this one, there's two voxels here in the BNST with lots more in the amygdala. But their contention or their argument is that if we can see any voxels in the BNST during what we're going to call fear or fear conditioning, then the BNST is actually not separable. And so they've got a line of research where they're really trying to show that these two things are the same. Um, and so it's really exciting to have this healthy kind of debate in the field. They also insist on calling it the BST instead of the BNST. And so we also have some um, fun banter about what should the spring region be called. And I think probably the truth lies somewhere in the middle. Um, for me, I do look at the dissociation sometimes, but I'm, I'm really just intrigued by the BNST and its role and if it could be a unique target for treatment. So to summarize this first part, um, we got from animal models two brain regions that are important for fear and anxiety and might suggest that those two are separable, which if they were, would actually have um, some important clinical relevance. For humans, we needed to develop tools and tasks to do this. Um, and this was a, a major thrust of my lab's work for a while is to see, can we actually measure this? Um, and I'll just say it was really fun and exciting to try to do that. I've seen people now doing that with the habinula and the periaqueductal gray. And so we actually can take some really small brain regions and image them. We have some exciting evidence from tasks um, that we can engage the BNST, including things like threat anticipation that weren't originally developed to study the BNST, but we were just studying anticipatory anxiety. Um, and then as a caveat, um, this is a very hotly um, active um, and contended area of research about are these actually separate regions or not. Um, I'll add a caveat when you're imaging over 30 to 40 minutes, talking about whether the brain regions are doing the same thing or not um, seems a little challenging because we don't have microsecond resolution about what brain region is coming on first um, and then responding later. These two are tightly, tightly coupled. Um, and so I think we'll need different methods to really determine if they're dissociable. Okay, so once we establish that, my goal was, well, can we use this to impact the lives of people who are suffering or children who are on a developmental trajectory towards um, long-term chronic anxiety or depression or substance use? And so I wanted to find ways to apply these into patient populations. Um, and what we had seen so far in the field that normative anxiety, and so I'm gonna call this like trait anxiety, people are high on trait anxiety, but not necessarily have an anxiety disorder. There was some really nice evidence. I'm just highlighting Leah Somerville's work here um, because it was some of the earliest work. I think the most elegant. Um, she's at Harvard now, and I think just got promoted to full professor. Um, and the other thing I really liked about Leah, you can see up at the top here, she had this brain region that I would call, it's probably the BNST, but she was very cautious. She's very precise and specific. And so she said, this is either ventral basal forebrain or BNST. At the time, we didn't have the mask, and, and so she was appropriately cautious. Um, I'll just tell you really quickly, this was different degrees of threat of a shock. 
And she had people in light gray that were low in trait anxiety um, or in dark gray, high in trait anxiety. And she found that the degree of shock really didn't impact BNST function for people low in anxiety. But for those high in anxiety, they had this parametrically um, increasing function that related to the potential degree of the shock. Um, here it is in a different study where she was looking at predictable versus unpredictable. Um, and so this is the BNST here showing the difference and a relevance to Robin's question, but also later, this is anterior insula showed a similar pattern. And, and Martin's done a ton of work on the insula as well. So the insula started to, to pop up. I was ignoring it um, at the time. I was very focused on the BNST. Um, in my lab, we had been studying social anxiety and risk for social anxiety. So that was the first place that I wanted to apply these methods. And so here's the task that we had developed. We'd actually initially, um, honestly, transparently, done this for threat anticipation by itself. So we had this task before we ever even knew what the BNST was. And we were studying um, responses to threat cues. For sure you're gonna see a threatening image or for sure this cue is that you're gonna see a neutral image. We used faces because of social anxiety. Um, but every time I had scanner time, if there was any time left over, I would throw in a new task. I would just come up with what I thought was the most wild task that I could think of um, which I'm very risk averse, that's so outside of my comfort zone. And so for several years, we had been throwing in this last run where all of a sudden there was a new image, a new cue that they had never seen before that was gonna be randomly followed by either fear or aversive faces. Okay, probably not totally random. Um, we had previously shown that if you knew something threatening was coming, different brain regions were engaged than if you did not know something threatening was coming. And so we had this idea of, oh, there's this unexpected or this um, uncertain thing that might happen. And so this was the original design. We have since modified it, um, but this was what we originally did. So we looked at BNST and amygdala during this task and we just extracted signal um, out of these whole brain regions. And here's what we found. We found that for unpredictable threat, we had this nice robust BNST signal um, but no amygdala signal, if anything, a little bit of deactivation and no signal to these other kinds of threats. Um, so this is very significant. Also just take note of the high amount of variability in this signal, and that will be a recurring theme. We also in that task could look at the image type. So here we've got the P threat, P neutral. So the images, the threatening images that followed the predictable cue for threat and neutral. Here we see in blue amygdala, signal, not BNST signal. A little something different happens for the unpredictable cue. So this is the threat image that followed the unpredictable cue and the neutral image that followed the unpredictable cue. Lots of variability. Um, and we see this kind of interesting U-shaped pattern. And we went back to the idea that the BNST and amygdala ideally should not be functioning at the same time. If they're dissociable, either one should be online or the other but not both. And so we were looking at the relationship between the two. And so this is on the y-axis of BNST minus amygdala to these unpredictable images here. And that correlated with social anxiety score. So it wasn't BNST by itself. Here, no relationship between BNST and the cues um, and social anxiety or images just by itself, it really was this separation, BNST versus amygdala. So people with higher anxiety, here, I'll show you here. I just split this into tertiles to, to show you what it looks like. So people with low anxiety had a teeny tiny bit of amygdala response. BNST, if anything, was suppressed or deactivated. Here, people in that middle range um, have an amygdala response when they see the threat cue, even if it was unpredictable. Um, but as you shift to high social anxiety, you have a stronger BNST relative to amygdala signal. So one thing this highlights is when you look at normative or look at healthy controls, typically they are low in social anxiety. You do not have people volunteering to come into a brain scan who are highly anxious. Um, and we've started to study this in, in large samples. They have very low social anxiety. So what we think of as a normative response may be quite different than what we see at higher levels of social anxiety disorder. About 20% of this group has a social anxiety disorder. Um, but here we can look at the full dimension. Um, the other thing we saw that was really the stronger finding for social anxiety 
was that it impacted or modulated BNST connectivity. Um, so I'll just highlight the brain regions. We found in a whole brain analysis, amygdala, here in red is the unpredictable cue. So people with higher social anxiety had less BNST amygdala connectivity. We also had just for the fear image, BNST connectivity with the dorsal anterior cingulate cortex. And here for unpredictable images, um, BNST with the ventromedial PFC, which is a region that we found um, was connected before. And so um, the take home message of this is that what we know mainly is that BNST is involved in normative anxiety, that we have correlations there. Actually, anxiety disorders have been mixed, but for us, for social anxiety disorder, we found that social anxiety was not associated with differences, um, was associated with differences in connectivity, but not activation. Um, so I have a message um, from S Sahib Kalasa. Does the BNST respond only to unpredictable, positively valenced cues? Or maybe in addition, oh, sorry, to negatively valence. Thank you, that's what I was doing. Um, because the amygdala has a role for both negative and positive valence. Um, and so that might be an interesting way to dissociate the function of the two regions. If you could say one was negative only and the other was positive and negative. Um, that is a great idea. I don't think anybody has done that, but given the BNST's involvement in addiction, and, and I'll, I'll tell you shortly, the focus has been on kind of negative affect and withdrawal, but it's also in the acquisition um, of addiction. Um, I think that's a really interesting question and the BNST might actually have a positive valence um, association as well, but that you're absolutely right. That'd be a great way to, to get to a dissociation. Um, so the addiction part is really this next step of this reverse translational. Um, the best way to do this work is to have an active collaborator who is a rodent researcher or non-human primate researcher. Um, and so I had this colleague, and I'll tell you about him in a minute, that really um, pushed me to do this work. So the other thing I'll say for trainees is um, the people that you meet at conferences who are like doing something different, that's a really amazing opportunity for a collaboration. Um, and so think out of the box. This is work that got funded very easily to my surprise. And I think there's something really interesting to people when you take two different fields and, and try to merge them or apply um, from one science to another. And this may be the way that we're actually gonna move science forward is collaborating kind of outside of our comfort zone. And so I told you before we had written this paper um, and it actually was at a conference. This guy, Kerry Ressler, who some of you may know, was talking about anxiety and addiction. I thought that was really intriguing, both the negative and positive valence pieces, but also just this transdiagnostic piece. And that had really gotten me thinking a lot about the BNST and addiction um, when we wrote this paper. Um, and so we had done this meta-analysis with this handful of studies and threat anticipation to show the anxiety circuitry. And we also showed that the addiction circuitry was you know, somewhat analogous. It had the BNST and amygdala, also had the ventral striatum, but there were hardly any studies looking at this addiction circuitry in humans, um, the BNST circuitry specifically. Lots of really beautiful work looking at reward processing and addiction. That's mainly where the human work had been, but very little in this other piece. Um, and so this is kind of a classic figure from George Koob, who's the head of NIAAA, and Nora Bolkow, who's the head of NIDA, talking about um, this cycle of addiction um, I've taken the, the cycle and put it in a linear form because this makes more sense to me is that we have this original stage where people start to use drugs, find it to be rewarding um, and continue and like to be intoxicated. And then you can get to this withdrawal phase in one of two ways. Um, once you've developed, I'm gonna use alcohol and alcohol use disorder. When you wake up in the morning and alcohol is out of your system, you can feel like crap and have withdrawal. So this can happen in the short term, but it, more importantly to me happens during attempts to become sober. So when people decide they wanna be sober and go into treatment or start going to AA, they can feel really bad. And of relevance to treatment success is that this phase of withdrawal negative affect can be really quickly removed by just drinking a little bit more. And so for me, this is a major barrier to successful treatment is the fact that with the addiction process, you end up with a brain that's highly susceptible to negative affect in the absence of that drug. 
and that you then have negative reinforcement processes that lead you to continue to drink. Um, for those of you interested in this other phase, this is this preoccupation. I'm now thinking about alcohol all the time. I'm craving it. It's the habit form um, that they proposed as prefrontal cortex. Here of interest is this withdrawal negative affect stage above this big red blob is the extended amygdala, which is the central nucleus of the amygdala and the BNST, and for some people, um, the nucleus accumbens, um, specifically the shell. And so I thought this was really interesting that, oh, here's the BNST, and it's about anxiety and depression. Oh, it's anxiety in another disorder. This is transdiagnostic. Um, and for me, at a practical level, this was a potential funding source and a potential collaboration um, with this colleague who I just really liked as a person and I really respected his science. And so this is him down here on the left, Danny Winder, um, who now is the director of our Vanderbilt Center for Addiction Research. And so he had been studying the BNST. He had also been studying novelty suppressed feeding, which I, I had been studying novelty for many years. So I was also interested in this. And he showed that this, what he calls a negative affect phenotype emerged during early abstinence, but not right away. So this down here shows that it emerged after about 18 days of abstinence. And so you can think about in humans, this immediate withdrawal where you have physical withdrawal potentially, but then over time, this would be analogous to like 30 days in humans, you end up with this anxiety and depression phenotype. And so now imagine trying to stop using a substance that you like and having this new onset anxiety and depression, which can make staying sober really challenging. So Danny was like, can we please just test this in humans? Can we just test the BNST? Like you know how to study the BNST. I know it's involved in abstinence. Um, how do we do this? And so the first struggle was, how do you take abstinence in a rodent and put it onto a human? And so luckily, um, this group had published a lovely review where they gave us this timeline. So here's acute withdrawal, which is kind of the traditional withdrawal symptoms. But here's early abstinence, anxiety and negative affect, sleep disturbances, anhedonia and dysphoria. And we had this um, translation of, well, here's what's happening in rodents, and then here's what's happening in humans. And so we were able to kind of map on Danny's 18 days to, well, we're probably looking at a month, 30 days, maybe out to three months. And I'll just tell you in humans, this protracted abstinence stage, you can have the same anxiety and depression for easily up to a year. So this does not go away quickly. Um, we decided we would target 30 to 60 days, which at the time of writing the grant seemed really feasible. Yeah, we'll totally get, like they'll be coming out of their residential treatment, 30, 30 to 60 days, we'll grab them, study them, no big deal. Um, and we had some really cool evidence from other labs that alcohol was specifically in humans was related to the BNST. Um, so this, or the amygdala. So this was um, Stephanie Gorka again, here's alcohol in red, placebo, sorry, placebo in red, alcohol in blue, and show that alcohol was effective in reducing um, amygdala response to angry faces. Um, this is Alec. Alex Shackman's lab, and he showed a reduction with alcohol for both the central nucleus and the BNST. And so there's also this kind of proof of concept of alcohol does dampen. So for anybody who's ever experienced anxiety and has also had a drink, um, you might have had the experience that alcohol does tend to reduce negative reactivity a little bit. And so this is just showing that experimentally. We also had this lovely evidence from the NPU task um, that Christian Grion had developed, again, this is with Stephanie Gorka, um, that we saw heightened startle to unpredictable threat across alcohol use disorder. So people with current AUD in early remission and sustained remission and at risk relative to controls. So there was a lot of converging evidence um, and we wanted to take that into the scanner. And so here's Danny. Um, and here's another collaboration story. He's like, gosh, we really need a human alcohol researcher. And he's like, I'm, I'm sitting on study section with this woman. She's really smart. Marissa Silveri, she's at McLean. Like, let's reach out to her. So we reached out. She's like, oh, I'm, I'd be happy to be a consultant. So we send the grant and like, we do not hear back from her for four weeks. And I'm like, ah, oh, well, you know, we'll just, we'll send it in without her. She like three days before the grants due, she emails and says, hey, I've just had a break in my like crazy schedule. I can review the grant right now if you want and sign a consultant letter. And we're like, yeah, great. So in two hours, she reads the grant, 
gives us really critical, amazing feedback. We quickly changed the grant, put her on board. Um, she's now one of my closest friends um, and we've continued, we're on each other's grants and continuing to publish together. And I think without her knowledge, this grant probably would not have been as successful, um, but it was successful. Um, we had no idea what we were doing. It turns out 30 to 60 days is not feasible. It's actually not easy to get people who are in early abstinence to come in and scan um, for very many different reasons. It's also hard to get truthful information out of people. So we had lots of people who were actually actively still using many different substances who were interested in getting some money um, from the study. So we realized pretty quickly we needed to have lots of screening, drug screening um, done at the first study visit. Um, but to translate, the first, like the very basic question was, do we actually have this anxiety or depression phenotype in humans during early absence? Can we translate even the phenotype? Clinically, clinicians would say, yes, people can be anxious and depressed during early abstinence, but there's relatively few studies actually providing kind of systematic investigation into this. And so this is just um, a histogram of the two groups. I gave them a million anxiety measures, social anxiety, worry, trade anxiety. They were all highly correlated. So this is just a composite um, across those. And in light blue is the healthy controls. So generally really low, but there's this little blip. So we did end up with this kind of high normative anxiety. While they don't have an anxiety disorder, we did end up with that group. And you can see also tremendous variability in the early abstinence group. Um, and I'm just realizing what time it is. So let me speed up a little bit. I'm going to skip a couple things. Um, first, we were looking at just threat cues, no difference in BNST, even across the cues. So this was not what we had seen before, but we had changed the task where everybody was trained on three cues, predictable, unpredictable, and threat. Um, and this is also faces, but overall BNST was higher than amygdala. So we did see that cues across the board engaged the BNST, not significantly more um, in early abstinence but very robust activation across the whole brain for cues that mapped beautifully onto what Forrest Clumpers had shown, which I showed you previously, and also onto this known salience network. And we've now seen this repeatedly in multiple different patient populations. Um, cues engage the salience network and the BNST. We decided to use a regression approach where we had a group variable, where we had some differences in anxiety variable, um, but most notably a group by anxiety interaction in cues. And here the insula started popping up and the insula has not stopped popping up um, in our lives and is now an active part of what we are looking at. And just to show you, we saw this correlation, here's the BNST with normative anxiety, similar to what Leah Somerville had shown, um, but not in the alcohol group. So this was kind of flat um, and they were not showing really engagement of the BNST or any of these brain regions to the cues at all. Um, we see this in young anxious children. They don't really respond to the cues, but instead they respond to the images. Um, it's like they're not able to engage anticipatory brain regions in advance. So we also looked at the images and you can see again, we have this massive group by anxiety interaction in many regions of the salience network, including dorsal anterior cingulate and insula. And here's what that looks like. So, here are the highly anxious who were engaging those brain regions before are not engaging them now, but we have a nice correlation in the early alcohol group. And so we're thinking about that this is kind of a delayed reaction um, where they're engaging these salience brain regions, but later. And so it's showing up when they're looking at images, but is modulated by unpredictability. So this is greater for unpredictable fear relative to predictable fear. We're also interested in um, BNST structure. We focused on a network that we know is structurally connected. Um, this is work that Lizzie Fluke has been analyzing the data. And just to say, we do have a foundation of across these regions, not only differences in group, but um, prominent sex differences. And out of this R21, this has been the major finding, um, lots and lots of sex differences, greater in women than men. BNST structural connectivity with the hypothalamus and the anterior insula. Um, we are seeing sex differences now. We're doing resting state connectivity as well. Um, so in summary, we are seeing an anxiety depression phenotype during early abstinence. We don't show this BNST um, 
just to unpredictable fear, we see it to all the cues. And the cues are not engaging those brain regions in our early abstinence group, and it's not correlating with anxiety, but we're seeing it in the images. Um, and we're starting to see some connectivity differences as well. And so I think one of the stories that's gonna emerge from the BNST is it's not activation specifically, and maybe connectivity in what networks are being engaged. Okay, so the final frontier is to train scientists to be able to speak both languages so that they can talk to each other and take rodent findings to humans and humans back to rodents in real time. And so Dan and I have been testing this model I'm with two, these are MD, PhD students, so Lizzie in my lab, Joe Lessinger in his lab. Um, and I'll just skip the motivation there. Danny found this really cool BNST insula finding that those projections were critically important in anxiety and early abstinence. We had not found the insula in our original study, but it may be because the insula is huge and heterogeneous and has this different cytoarchitecture across it from agranular to granular cell types. And so Lizzie found this great um, segmentation of the insula done by FARB, and we applied it to um, the large sample that we had published before. And the take home message is that we found that the BNST is very strongly connected with the anterior insula, but not as much with the rest of the insula. Um, if you're interested in sex differences, there are also sex differences here. What we're doing now is um, Lizzie goes to both lab meetings, my lab meeting and Danny's lab meeting, so that she learns the language of both and knows what they're doing in real time. And she provides this clinical perspective. And then she brings back to me findings from Danny's lab. And so our next step is to take what we're finding, like with the dorsal anterior cingulate, and see if we can translate that back. He can use optogenetics and lesion studies and electrophys to get kind of a better precision on the circuits than we can get. And so hopefully this work will continue, but that's, that's our idea. And I stuck this in this morning because we were talking about PTSD. This is, I'm gonna just quickly, quickly. Here's what I showed you before about the BNST. When we moved into a combat task, so these are horrible combat images, we saw something a little different. Still the BNST was modulated. The amygdala wasn't, but it was higher for everything. This is healthy controls. In combat controls, everything is suppressed, BNST and amygdala. In combat veterans, they had heightened BNST response to both unpredictable and predictable threat. So now imagine the system that's hyper aroused and hyperactive to all kinds of threat, not specific to unpredictable, um, but was BNST and not amygdala. And if we look at whole brain connectivity, it's BNST connectivity with both visual cortex, there's a little bit of subgenual here, but also this dorsomedial that's all more strongly connected in PTSD than in combat controls. And so um, we've just submitted a competing renewal for this. There's a lot of really exciting evidence that heterogeneity matters, which won't be a surprise, uh, but we think we have some nice preliminary data that the BNST is also involved in PTSD. Um, I'm gonna skip current projects to highlight my lab. Um, in blue are the collaborators for the work that I've shown you. Um, sadly, none of our undergrads are allowed to work with us right now because of COVID. Um, so we're working remotely just with one, Jesse Oler. Um, but as with all things, this is work funded by many different people and work done by many different people um, across different institutions. And so thank you um, for your attention. And um, I'll let um, Robin tell us if we have time for questions or, or people need to move on. Well, if, if people need to move on, I think that's totally understandable if anybody has meetings, but I would love to open it up to a few questions um, for people who can stick on for just a little bit. Uh, let me just uh, ask a quick question, um, Jenny. So um, in what way can the BNST become a treatment target? Uh, what, what do you envision um, you could uh, uh, do to, uh, you know, um, modulate and modify the BNST function? Um, the thing that first intrigued me that it may be a different treatment target than the treatments that target the amygdala or that we know reduce the amygdala is that the BNST responds as a different pharmacological response to things like SSRIs. So BNST I showed you is responsive to alcohol, probably not a treatment of choice. It's also very responsive to benzodiazepines, also probably something psychiatrists are not gonna pres prescribe but suggests that at least the pharmacological targets may be different. Um, one of the primary receptor types in the BNST is um, 
CRH receptors, a corticotropin releasing hormone or factor. And so people are looking at medications that may target those receptors. And there's also interest from rodent models in guanfacine um, as a BNST target regulator. It has been tested in clinical trials with combat veterans and was not effective. But my thought is that some people have this hyperactive BNST, not all people, not all combat veterans. And that if we could have a task that says, oh, you're an amygdala responder or you're a BNST responder um, or both, that we may be able to identify, okay, it's amygdala, let's do exposure for you. But if it's BNST, we may actually even just clinically wanna talk about uncertainty and exposure to uncertainty versus exposure to the trauma and that hopefully there will be medications and maybe it is guanfacine or something like that and that can target the BNST that would be different. And or the neuromodulation that you guys are doing and perhaps you could with CBT targeting uncertainty learn to reduce BNST activation um, in context of unpredictable threat. I put in a chat in the chat something but yeah, targeting BNT insula functional connectivity. Mm -hmm. So um, the so Lizzie loved the insula and Lizzie was like, Danny's doing this cool insula work and I want to do it. And so she really opened up this world of insula and, you know, um, Martin and Murray had been publishing insula stuff forever. Robin had been publishing insula stuff about uncertainty. And, and so that was clearly involved. I don't know why I ignored it, but I did. Um, but ever since Lizzie started looking at the insula, it's popping up everywhere. And so we do, we see BNST insula connectivity. It is really specific, typically to the anterior insula. Um, probably the group where we see the strongest difference is actually in schizophrenia. So we've been studying anxiety in the context of schizophrenia. Um, about 40% of patients with schizophrenia have a social anxiety disorder. And so we've been doing this unpredictable threat task with those patients. And we, again, don't find anything for cues um, in just activation, but we find lots of connectivity differences and that BNST insula is one of the most strongly impacted there. Um, so I, there's something, and, I'm, and obviously the amygdala is also connected with the insula, but the rodent work in addiction is, is pretty elegant. They're able to um, suppress that relationship with ketamine and then do agonists as well. And, and so um, they're mapping it. They've mapped it from the BNST, from the insula to the BNST, um, and then they've mapped it back to motor cortex to anterior insula to BNST. And so they're starting to look at what else the circuit might be. So I would say that story is um, emerging, um, and definitely the insula is a key player. Um, and for me, it's been fun to, to learn more about it and go back and it's like, oh yeah, everybody already knew it was involved, and now we're just trying to link it to the BNST. Um, oh, and during neurofeedback, yeah, I think even just mapping out what's happening live, this real-time fMRI and for different people and identifying. So I, I suspect what you're going to find is heterogeneity and that for different individuals, it's different patterns of connectivity. Um, so for some, it may be that insula is actually driving BNST and you want to downregulate that whole circuit. But for other people, you really want to upregulate some prefrontal cortical um, inhibition. The most tightly connected is ventromedial PFC, but I think, you know, there'll be broad circuits with like dorsal anterior cingulate. And so Vanderbilt loves personalized medicine, and that's really shaped how I think about individual differences and leveraging that to guide treatment is to be able to say, yeah, for you, it's really this circuit, um, which may be the same or different from other people. And so could you, we don't do neuromodulation here, but could you guys then do more neuromodulation that targets that individual's circuit and really customize um, the treatment to them. Uh, I have a question. Separating fear and anxiety, would you have any recommendations for selecting groups that have heightened fear, threat sensitivity over and above general trait anxiety? Um, I'll answer that first. My original idea was that the scale and tolerance of uncertainty would be ideal because um, it just you know maps on that doesn't necessarily map directly on. Um, we are seeing it correlated with BNST activity in healthy controls, but not in people with anxiety disorders. And so think about where you have normative anxiety versus the ranges of anxiety and anxiety disorders. Um, 
I think it's been surprising and important to me to see that the associations in kind of a healthy control population don't map on necessarily to patients. It may be something else in patients. Um, so I, I would still use that as a broad screen. Um, the hyperarousal concept out of PTSD, and so if you just look at like the PCL5 and pull out that hypervigilance, hyperarousal, um, that I think would be a good screen. And we're also seeing this social anxiety correlation. Um, so in the data I showed you, in the schizophrenia data, um, social anxiety correlates really well with BNST and patients with schizophrenia. Um, and I'm trying to think where else. So especially if you're using faces as part of your task, social anxiety seems ecologically valid. Um, I think if you start to talk to people, and even like as I talk to patients and, and kids in our anxiety studies, some people know that uncertainty is an issue for them. Um, and I think if you describe like, are you a person where this is the anxiety or is it, is it really about things that are gonna happen? Um, I think some people can separate those out. Um, I had this grant, it did not get funded, but the idea was we would measure the BNST and then 50 million other like questions and try to pick the questions that both mapped onto BNST. Like we needed a questionnaire that assessed BNST response. And you guys have that data, I believe, with your Tulsa 1000. So um, I'm handing that idea to anybody who wants to do that. I'd be happy to consult with you um, to just look at individual differences in BNST activity and, and what that correlates best with either psychophys or questionnaires. Um, that would be a beautiful way to get a good clinical tool that you could then test and use for outcomes. Um, and then does comorbid MDD potentially introduce noise to these concepts? Um, yes, of course. Um, because the original unpredictable threat startle data found less for GAD and less for MDD, and those often go together and genetically go together, I think this BNST may be somewhat separable from that. Um, maybe more in the social anxiety, um, PTSD realm, this kind of hypervigilance, different from the rumination, different from the just like, dysphoria, um, but it needs to be tested for sure and could even dampen. So depending on the kind of depression you have, if you have a really um, kind of what we think of as traditional depressive, although I guess it's not really, but you're sleeping too much, you're eating too much, you're just not engaged, you have anhedonia, you may be at the point where you're kind of burnt out to the anxiety. And so I think it would be within MDD, it would be that kind of hyper aroused state um, regardless of just the MDD diagnosis. Um, but those will be critical things to look at. All of our groups in general have MDD as part. So the PTSD group, definitely um, we allowed MDD. Beck depression scores themselves were not independent predictors of, of anything with BNST, but I would say that's a wide open area. Well, Jenny, I, I hate to uh, stop the questions, but um, maybe we'll, Hopefully there'll be some individual meetings and if anybody has other questions, you know, obviously reach out to Jenny um, and we can always, you know, uh, connect you with her if, if you don't have her contact information. Um, somebody, Teresa said that she wanted us to stay on the call, the PIs and AIs to try to do a virtual group photo. Um, so Teresa, I don't know, I will give it to you to, to navigate that. <laughs> Which means I need to make somebody else the host um, Robin, can I just make you the host? Sure. You can control and every, so that I can leave out of your picture. Oh no, 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 no. We want you in the picture. Oh, you want me in it's, the Yes, picture. it's with you. It's the Definitely. <laughs> purpose is we want you as <laughs> I want this like publicity material for your website where you guys, <laughs> okay, you're now the host and I'll stay on the call. Okay, good. <laughs> All right. Let's see. Switch to gallery view. All right, we're doing this. All right. Sorry, I'm just the voice in the background here. Um, all right, if everybody on three, one, two, three. Perfect. Thank you very much, everybody. <laughs> Wonderful. Thank you so much. And I think I meet with you. At, you have a break now, but then I meet with you at two. So I'll yeah. see you then. Okay. okay. Bye, everybody. Thanks, Jenny. Bye.